out for game night. Please let me know again if there are any issues with like sound or if you guys have any questions. Jen? Yes. I just want to make sure that Rhonda's with us. Oh, yeah, sure. I am. Why? Oh, oh, oh I saw a Thank comment you. up here that, that made um, me. So I just, I just was checking to see if we're recording this. Sorry, Jen. Oh, OK. It looks like it is recording from my screen. Does anyone else see that it's not? I think yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, I see that it is. Yeah, I see it now, too. OK, cool. OK, oh, so. Dear. All right. <laughs> okay, so let's let's watch this excerpt of, of game night. Uh, if anyone has like volume issues, just do like a this or a this. You know, we'll figure it out. Put it in the chat. Um, but this is about uh, eight minutes long crash course through this event that I did called game night. Round one.
or I told you, I'm sorry that other people messed up. It meant a lot. Was a crash course through uh, game night. Um, let me go back to the slides. Okay, great. So I wanted to point out some kind of key elements that uh, were the pieces that I would consider uh, concert design. So um, let's kind of break it down. First, I want to talk about repertoire, which is something that all of us are really familiar with, obviously. Um, we, we chose pieces for this, um, including two premieres. One was a commission and one was an adaptation of an existing piece um, that, that approached gameplay from different angles. So we had patty cake, we had video games, drinking games, a kind of charades. Um, and one piece I wanted to highlight in particular was the first piece, Game Time by Cassia Streb. Um, it was really interesting because it was an audience, audience participation piece and it had rules that the audience had to understand. So one of our choices was how do we convey this information to the audience um, in a way that contributes to the meaning of our concert instead of getting in the way of things. And what we realized is that any game night starts with reading the rules for the game you're gonna play. So we might as well just start the concert by reading the rules and how that would kind of actually enhance some of the references we were making instead of being an obstacle. Um, 
Another thing I wanted to mention were the transitions between pieces. Uh, we decided uh, to help the audience understand what piece we were playing and how it contributed to the concert by making these video transitions that looked like uh, rounds in a video game. So each piece we would press that button that we had uh, set up, created so that it would trigger these video transitions that would say what piece we were on and also what kind of gameplay we were referencing, whether it was patty cake, clapping games, drinking games, things like that. Um, and the button we decided to use instead of something more invisible like a pedal or uh, a space bar or something because it would make it look like we were in a game show or playing a game in front of everyone. We also wanted to do a visual pun on Concert Black. So we used part of our budget to make these custom um, custom jerseys that were the name of our, oops, backwards, were, were the name of our group. Um, so they're bowling, uh, bowling shirts, which is a, a sport, a game. So that's another kind of visual pun on this idea of Concert Black. What if the black itself was another reference to gaming? Um, and then throughout the concert, the audience played concert bingo, which were these bingo cards where they uh, had spaces like um, if they, so if they saw something happen during the concert, they would exit out and they could win a bingo prize during the concert, which you saw in the video, someone would win a bingo game. So it'd be things like someone yawns, there's an electronics fail, um, there's audible footsteps, there's mic feedback, all of these things that we've experienced in concerts that are generally like annoyances or distractions, we wanted to kind of acknowledge that they were happening and wrap them into our gameplay. So we made this bingo, bingo element of it, which created kind of a meta game over the entire concert. Um, so those were the kind of elements that we contributed to making this, uh, making the concert really, really holistic to our idea. So I wanted to take a minute and, and see if anyone had any kind of questions about that. I feel like I'm, I'm spewing a lot of information really quickly. <laughs> but does anyone have any questions or thoughts about uh, game night, what they saw? I'm going to bring up the chat too, I think. Or you can unmute yourself. I think this is a really great concept of having the audience being a part of the performance. This is really, really good. And yeah. I like the idea to make it more accessible, more fun. So, uh, but it's still, uh, it still stays, uh, still an art. Yeah. So I think this is great. This is, I like it. Yeah. Well, and um, accessibility is a really interesting thing to think about a lot because it can be viewed from a lot of different vantage points. I think a lot of times, when people feel, some people feel negatively towards accessibility because they can think of it as dumbing down a concert. But I think a lot of times you can think of it as enriching the concert because you're just being really thoughtful about how people are going, going to engage throughout the entire experience. So people are engaged and participating and have access to all of the ideas, but it's not coming from a place of simplifying, it's coming from a place of kind of enriching um, the concert. I want to check real quick. Rhonda, are we ending at 11.30 or sooner than that? Um, we, can, we can end at 11.45. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay. Just as long as we have like a few minutes to get up before, before Brian. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so um, then I'm going to keep chugging forward because I want to show you one other project I did and then I want to leave as much time for us to chat about these things. Um, okay, so the next thing I really want to share is a project that I did with a, a group I'm a part of called Middle Ear Projects with Cassia Streb. I have a link in the very beginning of the chat where you can see um, our website, which we're in the process of kind of uh, solidifying. It shows a lot of the projects we've done. If you want to kind of dig deeper into what con a lot of different kinds of concerts that are driven by the principles of concert design look like, um, that's a link there. So we were hired to do a concert recently by an organization called um, Synchrony. And I'm going to screen share again. See if I can get back to my... There we go. Okay. So 
uh, so this is a presenting arts organization called Synchrony. Um, so they came to us, they had these certain materials already. They already had um, a partnership with the local Audubon Society, which for anyone who doesn't know is like the birding, the bird watching society, um, local to Los Angeles. They had a venue, which was Deb's Park, the Audubon Center in Los Angeles. They had a date for the concert, which was Bird Day in Los Angeles. You see a theme emerging, birds, right? Um, and then they had con uh, commissioned seven world premieres uh, about birds. Basically, it was local composers who then uh, took a local bird and wrote a piece for it, which was then performed by uh, a local musician. So they had all of these pieces, um, but they felt a little bit lost about how to bring it together. So that's what they came to us for. Um, they needed to know how do we have people move around the park? So people are gonna come into this park and there's gonna be people playing bird music. How do we get people to understand that they're supposed to go and listen to the different pieces? Um, how do we give people a reason for listening to bird pieces? Are they just kind of like showing up to hear bird music or can there just be more of a, a meaning behind that? Um, and then how do we also make that family friendly but still enjoyable for more experienced concert go goers. So not like a kid's event, but also event that kids can come and thrive in and um, that families can come to. Um, so we created um, this idea of uniting it um, around the theme of bird watching, which is not like a, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to think of this, like all of the bird elements are there. This is the bird watching society. But we thought of framing the concert as a type of musical bird watching where um, where audience members would come and then find the bird pieces in the park, just as they would go and find regular birds on any other days. Um, so that would help people move around the park because they would understand that they're going to find things. It would give people a purpose for listening to the birds because it was kind of a, a hunt to find them all. Um, and it would make it family friendly because it also helps when kids can move around a space. Um, an additional thing we made to help make things um, more family friendly was this idea of a bird guide or a field guide. So a lot of times when you're birding, birders have like field guides to help them identify birds. So our field guide kind of, con uh, kind of functioned as a program. It was this booklet you can kind of see on the right um, where there was each bird was listed with a, with a little description about what the bird was like. And then there was a bunch of blank space. Um, and then it mentioned the performer and the composer. So what this did for, uh, for kids and concert goers was it told them what birds they needed to find. So as they went around, they had kind of a goal, like a catch them all kind of goal. Um, and then once people found the bird, they had something they could do to engage with the music while they were sitting. So the little kids could draw pictures of the birds or write reflections on the music, but something to do with their hands to kind of help sustain the listening, which is a really important thing as you get younger for kids. Um, we also had a station when you came in called the, um, the Outpost, um, where kids could make a craft for binoculars and a bird call. So they kind of had like a little kit for their birding. So that was the idea, but then the pandemic hit which uh, we all know kind of trashed boatloads of our plans. The really good thing, fortunate thing about our situation though, was because, because we had started with such a strong conceptual concept, it was a lot easier for us to pivot into an online experience. So uh, what Synchrony did was they took our, uh, our ideas for how to make it a live event and we helped them translate it into a website event. So that is also a link in the chat. I think it's the second link in there. It's called Synchrony Urban Birds. They made a website where you can go um, and find the different birds here. I'm gonna actually pull it up real quick um, so you guys can see how it works. Um, okay, so this is their website. And you go to the site and it's got this map of Deb, Deb's part and you look for the birds. So here's mine, it's really small. Let's see if it will load. My computer's gonna struggle. Okay, there we go. So you find the bird and it, what pops up is a video performance of the piece, information about the bird, the composers, a little question and answer and information about the performer. So here we have 
this was my performance of of one of the pieces because I was also a performer in this event, kind of a dual role. So all of the videos were filmed outside to help them fit into this idea of of a reflection of what it would have felt like to be in the park and to find these birds in special spots. Um, another very cool thing we did to help us with the pivot to um, to a online experience uh, was to make uh, a QR code scavenger hunt for kids. So families could download this field guide that they would have used at the real park. And then they downloaded these pieces of paper with um, images of the birds and a QR code. So you can kind of see it on the left here. A QR code is just a barcode. Probably a lot of you know about it. And if you hold your phone or tablet up to it, it will take you to a website. It's basically like a visual link that people don't have to type in. So what people could do was hide these uh, printed QR codes around their yard or their home and reconstruct a bird hunt so that their kids could go around with a device, scan the QR code, and then see the video of the performance, um, which is a really cool way of kind of translating that into that uh, event. So you can see on the right, the kids here are watching a video of my performance, and then they're still drawing in their field guides. It's a really similar experience. And all of that was possible because we started with such a strong conceptual element. If we had um, just stuck with the idea of seven bird pieces in the park, we would have, it, it would have been stuck there, right? The event would just have to have been postponed indefinitely. And ideally we'll, we will do it again next year because it's a great idea. We'll add more birds so it'll be fun. But we were able to still kind of, um, I mean, most importantly, the performers still got paid. They still got to put their work out there and we were able to put uh, to put this out something that's actually really useful for families. It's like a it's like a two hour activity in the end. And a lot of families right now are looking for ways to help their kids and um, and activities and experience to keep them going as they're being like homeschooled and and you know trapped in their houses. So um, so that was Urban Birds. Um, are there any thoughts or questions? We'll pause for a second about that. Reflections on how that all went together. Jen, Jen, I just wanted to mention that that sounds absolutely incredible. And you should, we should somehow get you to do it at the Museum of American Bird Art here in Canton, Massachusetts. Yeah. Which, which is um, an Audubon, you know, we have a huge Audubon Society here as well. And uh, that is right up their alley. It's a, you know, so just yeah. saying. Yeah. I mean, it's really applicable to a lot of things. Since we've done the QR code hunt, we're like, wow, what if we could pitch this idea for field trips? Because in the fall, kids might not be able to go to school, but people could use this as a form of field trips, hang a bunch of, um, like create a zoo in your home by hiding, you know, QR codes around and people scan the videos. It's this idea of like a tactile nature and getting kids moving around because you can make these web experiences, but I think we've all experienced like the fatigue of just sitting in one spot and looking at a screen. And it does feel really different if you're hunting them down in your environment. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. And everyone with families is headed out into nature every single day right now. So <laughs> this sounds cool. We, would, we could do something in our backyard instead of having to, you know, go God knows where. Yeah. Trespass. Yeah. So um, a really, okay, let me get back to the switching the screens. Okay, so something uh, that I think is important to acknowledge. Um, will people get, notice, understand everything that I'm doing with concert design? Or is, this, is this something that people are gonna see all of the little details? No. And does it matter? No. Um, What's really important in this work is an idea of richness. Um, we, I mentioned it earlier with, uh, with Edward when we were talking about this idea of accessibility. Um, it's, it's, it's making things deep so that people can get into them in whatever level they can. I have this really fun quote. It's very long and that's the whole point by Annie Saunders. Um, she uh, was making, this is a part of an article, I've linked it in the chat, 
it's a great article on liveness. Um, and she was talking about a site specific performance um, that she was making kind of an opera uh, that talked about mermaid fairy tales and the life of Anne Sexton. So I'm gonna read this long quote. Um, I was in the phase where you're sort of exhaustedly swimming around in the dramaturgy. How the mermaid sacrifices her mode of expression, voice for escape, how she is told she will have graceful human legs, but will be in excruciating pain all the time and unable to tell anyone, how Sexton's life was so clearly a parable of that story to me, how women's voices both, both politically and anatomically are silenced, how women's mouths and tongues and throats are so fraught and objectified in culture in terms of speaking, screaming, food, sex, and what they mean in the context of opera, the open female throat and the mouth of that medium, lungs, their connection to deep sea diving, mermaids, whale song, the vagus nerve in the throat and the idea that our emotions live in it, that this nerve can be soothed by eating, drinking, singing, swallowing. Sexton, like so many in her situation, was, was addicted to pills. And also, did you know that she and her friend, Maxine Cuman, another socially isolated, on and on and on. I reeled all this off to my mother. What's the matter, she said. I want to say all these things to the audience. I want them to know all this cool stuff we found out and found out about and how it's all connected and everything. Whales, the emotion nerve, diving, breath, singing, mouths, phones, channels, throats, suicide, silence, water, women. I can't figure out how to get it all in there. I don't know what to say or not say, I said. It's fine, they will sense it, she said. They'll be in the room. And then she said, only tell them exactly what they need to know and let them feel the rest. And it stopped me in my tracks. I remember right where I was standing. So this idea that they will sense it. Our, our job or my job as I see it in this work is to de design richness, to make things that are deep um, and that people can kind of sink into, dig into and sense the meaning. And I have been to events where I sense that meaning and I can't always put my finger on it, but you can feel it. So it's not a matter of explicit um, information. We don't in music do a very good job of communicating information directly, but we do a great job of creating the sense of meaning and a depth of richness. Um, and one of the things that I found really beautiful is that even I don't see all the connections and in this kind of works, even you wouldn't see all the connections and after it and in the middle of this process, you even learn from your own way of making art. So like in game night, I thought about, I mentioned lightness and play and delight and family. But what I learned from making the concert was that storytelling is a huge part of gameplay. I think four out of six of the pieces we programmed deal, dealt expressly with this idea of storytelling and, and games as a way of processing our lives and playing out our stories. Um, and that gameplay really can't happen without community. It's not a singular, I mean, it can video games, right? But um, the pieces brought people together in action and then also in their laughter and their responses. So there's this really vivid sense of community that I just hadn't anticipated in, in the concert ahead of time. And it's something I learned from making the art myself. Um, so that's the process I have been in and kind of discovering the different pieces I can contribute to, con control um, the way I can make these, these greater kind of statements and bring pieces together um, into these really rich, rich meanings. So I'm going to leave the rest of the time so we can chat because I've thrown a lot of information your way. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to it. Um, and that is my ideas around this idea of concert design. Thanks, Jen. So listen, I have a, a, just a quick question and I'll open it up for everybody. Um, so how did you get from the concert uh, with Bach and um, Debussy and <laughs> to this? I mean, right. what, because they seem pretty far apart. But so yes. how, what was, how did you get there? Okay, so um, I, yeah, this is important to note. This has been something I've been working on for 10 years. So it's not like, a, oh, I'm going to design these really complicated concerts right now. So the the 
um, the Bach, the WC, uh, that concert, I, I started there and I was just like, man, I don't want to end with the grand finale. It just feels hollow. I just don't want to. And so I was doing, I think, the Britain, uh, the, uh, Britain cello suite, the third suite on that concert. And it ends with the least flashy thing in the entire world. It's just this like very somber, broken march. Um, and it's, it's the wrong way to end a concert, right? Like uh, I should end with like a showpiece. And I just, it felt hollow to me where instead I could le end with this, this somber feeling of reflection, um, the kind of deepest point of the concert in my, in my um, opinion. So that's what I did. And I, Kind of constructed the concert through like key changes so that there'd be like an uh, oral oral continuity to things um so that i could end in the emotional space that i wanted the audience to live leave with so that was kind of my first version of it like how do i want the audience to feel through these pieces and what emotional space do i want to leave them in at the end um and then I just kept kind of pondering on this idea of like, how do I shape emotional spaces? I had a lot of big questions um, for my doctoral program. I was very interested in the idea of liveness and really skeptical of the need for live concerts. Um, it's like kind of a whole other talk, but I think um, recordings are really incredible. And um, if the idea is that concerts are the best way to hear music, I'm not sure that that's always the case. And so um, I was looking at pieces that, um, that through other structures had to be heard live. So that was like a, a four concert exploration where I looked at, I was basically asking myself, like, do I need to be doing live music? And what are the pieces that make me need this thing? Um, and then presenting them as a concert. Um, that was more dealing with the individual repertoire. And then when I started working with Rachel, which was about four years ago, um, we started doing these concerts with, with questions. Our first question was how, um, what happens if I don't play with my instrument, right? Like I am Jennifer Bewercy cellist. Am I still a musician if I'm just Jennifer Bewercy or do I need that comma cello to like be a musician? So that was our question. Um, and so we took pieces that put the instruments aside and tried to like learn about our identities through like doing those pieces. And we learned things like um, our bodies became really political when we put our instruments away. We weren't, I wasn't a cellist. I was Jennifer Bewercy comma woman on stage. Um, a lot of the pieces we were constructed or we were um, performing were constructed for this kind of neutral body, which was the male body. And we had to kind of recreate how they would fit onto our own bodies. So we entered into this really like identity rich, like political space, um, which was a huge learning experience. Um, and then from there, we pivoted to uh, this, P this concert where we uh, put together, this was a concert where I played my cello where we put together the music of Peter Oblinger, who's a fascinating composer, like really hard to summarize, but really worth looking into, um, who deals a lot with like how sound moves. Um, so he had these series of pieces that uh, use white noise to block out parts of the sound um, so that you can't hear them. So like if you've ever been in a restaurant that's really loud, and you can't hear some people's voices very well, but you can hear other people's voices fine. It has to do a little bit with like the register and how the noise of the audience is kind of obscuring different registers. Anyways, that was kind of a sonic exploration that we did in the dark because it was um, emphasizing what people hear, heard. So we kind of slowly morphed. It was like an additive process where we learned new ways we could manipulate the way people hear, like turning out the lights or, um, or changing the order of the pieces, approaching the concerts from a question. It was a really a long process. And, it, and it's only in the last two years or so that I've realized, been kind of able to name that um, what it is is the concert that I'm manipulating, not just the pieces, but like all of these the idea of the lighting, the idea of the, what you wear, um, how the technology works, 
how the pieces flow from one to another, how long the concert is, is an important uh, like feature of things. So it's really been like an additive process that goes from like just a curiosity of like, what do I want my audience to feel? And through all these kinds of explorations of like how I can, how I can explore things and help my audience feel those explorations too. Long answer. <laughs> It's a good answer. <laughs> but I do think it's important to know that these things take time. And I have a lot of skills that I've built up. I love learning new skills, uh, video editing, running uh, electronics in a concert, graphic design. Um, I had a graphic design job for five years that I learned a lot for from. So it's not, it's just not an overnight thing, but it's a really cool way of thinking about the work. And it does kind of lean, like lead to a lot of skills, a lot of like very cool ways of doing things. Jen? Yes. Hi. I'm curious about um, your own experience now, just going to a, a more conventionally formatted concert and just sort of what that's, like, how is the weave of, of that part of musical life for you? Or have you just completely crossed, crossed over? <laughs> no, I, I love concerts. I love all concerts. And um, I, 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 when I go to kind of more traditional concerts, um, it really, it really depends. I mean, I feel like every concert is kind of like a person in a way, like they're really different. Sometimes I do get very irritated by like things that I think could have been handled better. Um, like if you see, and, and just let me make it clear that like I have made these, I have done these things, <laughs> like all, all of us have done these. But so like, for example, if each uh, piece is like a massive change of instrumentation and set and you kind of spend more time watching people move things on stage than you do listening to the music. And I'm just, part of me is just like, really, did you need to do all of these pieces? Or could we have like set them up on the stage and then have like one big change in the middle while we all take a break or something like that? You know, this idea that like, you know, I, I wish people had been more thoughtful about that. So I do tend to kind of notice these things more. And I think a lot of us already notice them, whether we, we think of them in this context framework or not. Um, I, and I really appreciate, uh, like a thoughtfulness to these features. Like when people do kind of have something that's very edited feeling and, um, takes me as a listener kind of through the concert, even if it's not like high concept, whatever, um, I just feel very cared for. And I noticed that and it's like, it's wonderful. Um, so I think there's all kinds of levels. I did a concert recently of, uh, a piece by Jörg Frey and a piece by Morton Feldman, um, his, uh, which uh, the, they're both very, very quiet and meditative pieces. So they kind of have that aesthetic shared between them. Um, and we could have just done them, right? And, and just kind of not thought about it. But um, when you listen to very quiet, long music as an audience member, it can be very physically draining because every movement you make is like a contributor to the sound that's happening. And it's like very, so we were thinking of things like, man, this venue has crappy chairs. What are we gonna do for people, right? Because they're gonna be sitting in these horrible folding chairs for 45 minutes listening to Feldman. Well, we absolutely have to take a break before the Feldman so that people can get up and stretch and move around so that when they're sitting through the 45 minute piece, they're not just like, getting cramps and discomfort, right? So it wasn't like a high concept decision, but it was really thinking about like how people would sit through this concert and experience it. Um, and then we also lit the piece uh, with this very kind of low ambient lighting um, with the understanding that people might fall asleep and that we would kind of enhance this really meditative state and being very okay with that. Like as opposed to like, traditional concert lighting, um, which to me kind of evokes more of a like, okay, sit and pay attention, we're doing something, right? Uh, letting people kind of zone out a little bit more and, and being very okay with that, um, 
that kind of listening was a conscious decision we made. And we also kept the concert to, I think it was 60 minutes. Uh, it might've been a little bit longer than that with the, the intermission. But knowing that um, we, were, we were going to be asking people to sit quietly, which is a, a high demanding way of sitting for long periods of time. So that if we extended the concert much longer than that, we had to have a really good reason for asking them to sit there in that way, right? So, um, so that would be like a more traditional repertoire concert. But we just thought really carefully about what people were going to be experiencing and feeling, and how we could um, contribute into that, that contribute that contribute to those feelings in a way that would help people just listen better and hear what we were trying to do better. It's so, that, so lovely to think about that as like kind of a baby step yeah. towards, a, you know, a, a broader sense of how you present yourself to just be like, what is it like for someone who's at this concert? Like, yeah. th th there's so many little things exactly. that one could. Jen? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, talked about duration of concerts. Yeah. Um, so we're used to the epic concerts. Have you, uh, what are your thoughts on the flash the haiku concert. I love that you brought this up. Um, how short? How short can a concert be, and have a huge impact, or somehow shift those yeah. in attendance? Does it okay. need to have duration? No. Uh, I'll give an example. Um, duration is so fun to play with. So I did this concert uh, with the Without Walls Festival, which is an outdoor theater festival in La Jolla, which is near. It's in the San Diego area of California. So it's a the La Jolla Playhouse opens up their grounds to all kinds of presentations. And I wanted to do a performance with that. So the piece I proposed and ended up performing was called Seven Butterflies and it was called a micro concert. The concert was about 15 minutes long um, and it uh, was a simultaneous performance of two pieces, Kaya Sariaho's Sep Papillon, which is translates to seven butterflies, seven micro, um, uh, seven miniature butterfly pieces. They're really ephemeral and evocative. Um, and they kind of musically deal with this idea of ephemeralness. Um, and then during that, I was going to be also performing this piece uh, by Lamont Young called Compositions 1960 Number no. 5. And that's a text piece. And the instructions essentially say, release a butterfly into the performance space. And when the butterfly flies away, the piece is over. Right, so I've been wanting to do this piece forever, but how do you humanely release a butterfly into a space without basically releasing it to its death in like a concert hall? Um, so when I had this opportunity to do an outdoor performance, I layered these two pieces. So the way it worked in the festival is I did seven micro concerts um, because it's seven butterflies, might as well do seven performances of it. And the way each one worked is I the people gathered around. I released the butterfly. Um, it was a monarch butterfly, which is a, indi uh, a, a local species and a species under kind of duress. So I use that, that chance to talk about like the need to um, help in, ensure their environment and their sustain. And, you know, I didn't want to release a butterfly to its death, basically. <laughs> like this is a butterfly that can thrive in our local uh, habitat. So release the butterfly. And then as the butterfly is doing its thing, I went and performed Set Papillon. And then when I was done and the butterfly was gone, the piece was over. And it usually lasted about 15 minutes. The butterflies kind of booked it pretty fast. And then as soon as I was finished with my performance, the concert was over. But that was a really fun way of messing with the idea of duration, um, but in a really kind of focused and intentional way to reflect the content that I wanted to um, express in the performance. Yeah, go ahead, David. Well, yeah, I just, I thought this might be kind of a fun moment to reference uh, Rhonda and I last fall and maybe some other people on the call, we did something called the Concerts for One, which was done by the um, Celebrity Series. And we sat in a room and played one minute concerts for audiences of one for I don't know, two hours. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think we both had a blast, didn't you, Rhonda? Wasn't that fun? It was pretty amazing. We were in shipping containers and they would, um, you were in this, so you were in this rather small space 
big enough to, to bow comfortably, but small space, someone would walk in the door and sit directly in front of you and you would play for not longer than 60 seconds. And we had different pieces. I would, I would sort of, I would take a look at the person and sort of, and talk to them just for like a second to see if they were, you know, if they knew about music a little bit or maybe not at all and would gear it accordingly. And some, some people brought children in, it was very cool. But it was like 60 seconds, that's it. And then they leave. Yeah. Just thought it would be fun to mention that. It's great. Yeah. I mean, duration is just one of our tools, right? Like we can really make some great choices with duration. Um, uh, I, last night with the Morton Feldman, I was thinking about um, uh, something really cool I heard from one of my past teachers, Charles Curtis, when he talked about duration, he talked about it in terms of disorienting people too. We all kind of have uh, little scripts of duration. So like new music would be seven to 10 minutes, right? Uh, a, a short television show is about 23 minutes with commercials. A longer television show is about 43 minutes with commercials. A movie is anywhere from 90 minutes to an hour 20. Now they're a little bit longer, but we have these like social references for like how long things last. Um, and so we as artists, if we want to engage with duration as something we want to manipulate so that people's kind of experience of time is different, we can use those references and break them. So for example, these, uh, the Feldman Quartet that's six hours, we don't have entertainment references for six hours, right? That is something that transports us from our frames of reference into something totally different. And it kind of, um, it, it's like a good way of breaking yourself, right? <laughs> of like breaking your expectations of what things should feel like or do feel like. Um, and that kind of listening can transport audience members into a different way of perceiving where maybe you're more aware of your body, you're aware of how your focus goes in and out and in and out. Um, you, it's just kind of a different kind of listening than a narrative structure where you would kind of beginning, middle and end it within kind of a, a frame of reference for how long you know things probably last. So you, so you go from being able to navigate a, a time with a sense of agency and like tracking to being at sea in time. Like, I don't know what's happening to me. I don't know how long it's been. I don't know how much longer it will be. And that can be a cool thing to surrender to, especially if as performers, we're doing it really consciously. Yeah, David? Just going to mention that the thing about that particular piece is that you would think it's boring and it's absolutely not. It's unbelievable. Like if you get a, D a CD of that, I think it takes five CDs or something, but if you actually on YouTube, you can now there's full six hour performances. And if you just slot your thing through it, every time you do that, the sounds will be completely different and utterly engaging. It's really crazy how good it is. It's just six hours. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Amanda, or uh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading names off the thing. <laughs> uh, Nick. <laughs> Nick um, so I, that kind of brings up an interesting question to me, which is, if we have this piece of art, which is incredible at six hours long, can we as performers say, okay, I'm gonna take 30 minutes of this and put it in a concert. Can, can we design our concerts that far so that we in a way remove the art from what it was originally intended and we reinterpret it in our minds? I think everyone is gonna have their own answer for this. My answer is yes, I'm not, I am okay with a little blasphemy and sacrilegious as it comes to these things personally. Um, I'll give one example. There's this piece by Vinko Globacar called Corporal, which is a body percussion piece. So you do things like. Jen, we just lost Jen. you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, the sound's not gonna be as good, but I think I just hit my mic. So, <laughs> anyways, so it's a body percussion piece, um, and um, and when I mentioned earlier this idea that like the the male body scene is like the neutral that is written for, and then women kind of have to adapt. This piece is an example of that. It's written for a per performer. It's not written for men specifically, but it involves performing shirtless and um, and 
tapping different parts of your chest in a way that like disregards that 50% of the population may or may not have breasts. So, um, so we took that, uh, my friend and I, we took that piece and we not only made it from a solo into a duo, which is a pretty radical like department, but we wanted to, but we also made decisions like, we're not gonna perform this shirtless because if we did, uh, we would be introducing like a very sexual element into things, which is a little bit beyond our control because just women's bodies are sexualized in that way. So we kind of had to make the choice, do we wanna move into a more sexualized interpretation or do we wanna stick with a, a less, less sexualized? So we decided to use our shirts, but then we also had dealt with like where we were going to hit on our bodies. Um, so then for a second performance of it, after we had lived with the piece a little bit longer, um, it involves like messing up your hair and like swiping your face. It's a very cool piece worth looking up. Uh, Corporal by Vinko Globacar. Um, we realized that in a um, neutral male performance of this, often it's interpreted as kind of like craziness. Like they get wild hair, they kind of like get red chests, this idea of like the eccentric genius kind of thing. Um, but then when we were doing it as women, it had a lot more of, um, it, it made us think a lot about like the perfection that women are expected to present, like made up nice hair. And this idea of like a disheveled woman is its own, a woman is its own kind of radical. So we decided to use the piece for our own ends. Like I have no problem with that. And so we like put on like, like full makeup and then throughout the piece allowed ourselves to become more and more disheveled, kind of uh, um, in, in kind of a commentary on what the piece doesn't accommodate, right? Like, so it, the, since the piece doesn't accommodate our bodies, we're going to highlight that, right? We're going to make that the, a feature of the piece, whether the, it was designed to be for that reason or not, um, kind of just, uh, I think, to put it bluntly, like using the piece for our own like political agenda at that point. And so I feel personally like completely comfortable with that kind of thing. I think it just has to be done like thoughtfully. If if you were like, oh, I just want to, I really want to do the Feldman Quartet, but I only have time for 30 minutes, eh, less of a good reason. But if you're like, oh my gosh, this part of the Feldman Quartet, like references this other piece in a way that I don't think anyone has ever noticed and what if we like performed this segment and then went right into this other piece that we really want to do and that would like show this intersection that I don't think anyone's noticed before like that's a really maybe a good reason to do an excerpt of something because you have another purpose to it cool that's this this has been great Jen I, I think we probably should should wrap it up pretty soon, but this has been really, really fun. Does anyone have any last questions for Jen? I like the idea of haiku concert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you cleared it all up for us, Jen. <laughs> Great. Good. <laughs> so, so Byron, tomorrow I want you to talk about your recital at Boco, okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah do that. Oh, I yeah, need Jerry. to help. That's all right. Oh, I see your mouth moving, Byron, but I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, the concert, my backstage on stage, is that the one you talked about? Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. One. I'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> okay, you good. Know, I, I, I think it's kind of fun that we all have some, we actually have way more examples to point to of, I guess, what you'd call so-called unconventional concerts than we might have 25 years ago. I don't know if that's true or not, but it feels like there are lots of good examples for to bring to Jen's table for discussion. Thanks, Jen. Great, thanks, Thank Jen. Okay, so let's take a little break and come back and come back at three o'clock. Okay.